Welcome back to the podcast, guys. Hope you're all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be talking about the latest issue regarding Gillen Maxwell's sentencing that's coming up uh, at the end of this month, month on June 28th. Uh, people will be attending there. I posted the directions on um, where you have to go if you want to actually see the sentencing. You can see it yourself. Gil and Maxwell will be in the courtroom. I put the directions for all of that on my community tab. So go to my channel page, click on the community tab, and you'll be able to see the information you need if you want to actually attend. You can go personally if you're in New York. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend given the fact that I'm in California. But nevertheless, today we're going to be talking about an issue that has arisen because of two people that want to uh, give victims impact statements at the sentencing. And uh, Gillen Maxwell's side has opposed this uh, motion. Uh, and unfortunately, they have some legal grounds, all the legal grounds actually, to make a case. So I don't necessarily like doing these videos, but nevertheless, we have to be impartial when it comes to the law. And in this case, the law is on Gillen Maxwell's side because the people who are asking to um, give statements were not people who were uh, represented or presented by the prosecution during the trial. They are victims of Jeffrey Epstein, yes, but nevertheless, they were not part of this trial. And therefore, Gillen Maxwell's side has some good arguments as to why their statements should not be presented uh, during the sentencing because the sentencing, uh, the victim impact statements are for direct victims of the crimes that were committed by the convicted party in in the trial that just took place. And these pe these two people here, Sarah Ransom and Elizabeth Stein, were not involved in this trial. OK, so the people in question here, this is Elizabeth Stein. I don't know. Uh, anything about her actually she wasn't in any of the legal papers that i've read and i've let i've read almost everything related to um jeffrey epstein and gillen maxwell she has not occurred in any of them um she might have been somebody who filed a civil lawsuit but i haven't seen her name anywhere so she's completely unfamiliar to me i know a lot about uh, sarah ransom her story was in multiple documentaries she was a victim of jeffrey epstein and she also claims that she was a victim of gillen maxwell but she was not a victim in the time periods that Gillen Maxwell was prosecuted in this case. So I always talk about how the law is specific and you have to abide by the specifics parameters of the law when it comes to the trial. So the people who can testify, the people who can legally testify, not testify, the people who can legally give a vi uh, victim impact statements are the direct victims of Gillen Maxwell, who she was prosecuted for in this trial. Who are those people? Well, those people are the people who testified at trial and the ones that were uh, indicated in the indictment. She was charged on six counts of sex trafficking, sex trafficking, conspiracy and other related things. Um, and the people who can testify on uh, on those uh, on that indictment and the charges against her were Jane, um, who appeared and we looked at her testimony in detail during the trial uh, on my channel and everywhere else. Um, Kate, who was another witness and victim of Jeffrey uh, of uh, Gillen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, in this case, Gillen Maxwell is the one, be one being prosecuted. Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Uh, third person, Caroline. And fourth person, Annie Farmer. OK, so those are the people. Those are the real victims of this particular crime that she was charged with that can testify that can I keep saying testify that can give oral or written victim impact statements during the sentencing phase. So they are uh, the uh, the Sarah Ransom and Stein lawyer cite 18 U.S. Code 3771, which is the Victims uh, Rights Act. Um, and they cite that over here saying the right to be reasonably heard at any public proceeding in the district court involving release, plea, sentencing or any parole proceeding. And that's what they're using here to cite their right to appear during the sentencing, claiming that Miss Ransom was a victim of Gillen Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. They're, they're claiming that um, both these people should be allowed to appear in front of the judge and give a statement. OK, so that's what they're asking for. Gillen Maxwell's side is opposed to this. And like I said, the law is on their side. OK, so this is what uh, they have to say. The conduct underlying the offenses charged against Ms. Maxwell ended in or about 2004. To our understanding, Ms. Rams, uh, Ransom alleges that she was a victim of Epstein and Ms. Maxwell from approximately October of 2006 to 2007, a full two years after the conduct in this case. So, as you guys know, uh, if you've been watching my videos, the uh, the first indictment that was filed uh, charged her with crimes, I believe, um, in the 1990s, from 1990. 
1991 to 1994. And then in the second indictment, we extended that to 2000 to 2004, if I'm not mistaken. It might be 2001 to 2004, but it was uh, it was extended from the 1990s to the 2000s because of the introductions of, of another victim. And all four of those victims testified, Kate, Annie Farmer, Caroline, and Jane. OK, uh, those those four people can offer their uh, victim impact statements because they were listed in the indictment. The trial had to do directly with them. Uh, so them, those four people and their uh, close direct family members can come and testify. OK, so that's clear. That's law uh, and that's understood. But these these two people, uh, Miss Stein and Miss Ransom, were not in the trial. They were not charged in the indictment. Uh, crimes against them were not in this indictment. They were not used by the prosecution in any way. So they don't really have a leg to, leg to stand on. And plus, the crimes that they claim happened in 2006 to 2007, when that's not related to this case, because the crimes that are charged against Gillen Maxwell had to do in the 1990s, the early 1990s, and in the early 2000s. They ended the, the time period for the prosecution that just happened where she was convicted were from crimes that commit, that ended in 2004. According to Ransom's own account, she was victimized in 2006-2007. So she, she's not really part, uh, legally speaking, strictly speaking in this trial, she's not part of the crimes that are charged in, this, in these indictments. There are two indictments that were filed against Maxwell, the first one that was originally filed and then the second superseding indictment, which all of which I covered on my channel. And she was not part of any of that. OK, so they go on to say she was not part of that. The, the period she therefore does not qualify as a crime victim under the CVRA. We do not know when Miss Stein, who is the other person, alleges that she was a victim, but she would also not qualify as a crime victim if the conduct she alleges post dates 2004 or she was not a minor. According to uncorroborated press reports, Miss Stein claims to have met Maxwell in 1994 when Miss Stein was 21 years old and not a minor. So a lot of the girls that 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 were victims of Epstein and Maxwell were uh, minors at the time, which is what gives them rights under the CVRA. And according to her own account, she was 21 when she met Maxwell and therefore does not qualify uh, for that exception being a minor. OK. And they go on to say further, Miss Maxwell's sentencing proceeding should not be an open forum for any alleged victim to be heard. Neither Miss Ransom nor Miss Stein are part of the record in this case. All of that is true. Uh, we are concerned about the impact statement by alleged victim victims who were not part of the trial or whose names are not part of the record and uh, who otherwise did not qualify as crime victims under the CVRA will have on the court's sentencing uh, determination. They're worried about the impact of these uncorroborated accounts on the judge. That's what they're saying there. We request a preview of the manner in which the court will conduct the sentencing proceeding and advance notice of the individuals who will be, uh, who will be permitted to speak. Okay, so let's go to the law here, okay? So this is uh, the law in question, uh, 18 U.S. Code 3771, which is the Victims' Rights Act, Crime Victims' Rights Act, and they're referring to this part, where it says the right to be reasonably heard at public hearings like sentencing. That's what they're pointing to, the uh, Stein and Ransom side. And the Gill and Maxwell side is pointing to the definition of a victim. A crime victim means the person against whom the state offense is committed, or if that person is killed or incapacitated, that person's family member or other lawful representative. So any logical definition of victim, according to just regular jurisprudence, would be somebody who's a direct victim of the crime we're speaking. And unfortunately, neither Stein or Ransom were stated uh, by the prosecution as victims of Gill and Maxwell in this case. Now, you can say that outside of this case, she was a victim of Jeffrey Epstein. I believe that she was ransom was i don't know much about stein so i can't say but ransom definitely was a victim of of jeffrey epstein uh, according to her a record and i believe her story but nevertheless in this case this is a very specific criminal prosecution against gill and maxwell okay so the people who can testify are the people who were cited in the indictment and presented at trial and those people were the victims that i talked about annie farmer kate caroline and jane OK, now, Annie Farmer, uh, being the fact that she's a victim, she might be able to open the door for Maria Farmer to also come and testify or testify, give her account of um, what she faced because of her sister's abuse at the hands of Maxwell and Epstein. So 
given the fact that Maria Farmer is a direct relative of Annie Farmer, she might be able to come and testify because she's a direct relative and therefore impacted by the crimes that happened to Annie Farmer. So she might be able to come in and, and Jane and Caroline and Kate will be able to bring in their direct family members to testify on the uh, testify as to what how this crime impacted their family. OK, the whole point of these uh, impact statement is to let the judge know what kind of damage has been done to the victims as a result of these crimes. OK, that's the whole point of doing this. Now, like I said, um, uh, I believe Ransom was a victim, but she was not a victim uh, of the charges in this particular trial. She was not involved in this. OK, so according to the law, which is very specific and to the point, and also the, the judge has to worry about defending the rights of uh, the accused as well. So Gillen Maxwell has rights under the Constitution and you can't present people, witnesses, you can't present people who are not involved and not material in this case as a way to sway the judge's um, sentencing you know, decision when it comes to Gill and Maxwell, whether she goes high or low or medium or whatever, the, whatever it is, she can't be swayed by people who are not a party to this case. Okay. So again, the four victims who are presented there and their family members can come and speak. And I think there'll be enough to sway the judge to give her a pretty high sentence. Like I said, she'll probably get somewhere between, uh, I would say, 24 to 30 years. I don't know. Judge Nathan has been, is somebody who's probably going to be tough on Gillen Maxwell. That's my sense of it. But who knows? Gillen Maxwell's side will also be able to uh, bring family members and other people to come and speak on her behalf. And she'll bring her sisters and her, uh, you know, her brothers and, and everybody else to say that she's such a good person and that she's not she's not a criminal and she's a good person even though she made some bad decisions and therefore the judge should go easy on her that's what the family members of gill and max are going to say of course we all know that They're, they already said that they've been saying that for for a long while now um but anyways so I just explained the law to you guys. That's how the law stands. Even though um, these two people might have been victims of Epstein or De Ransom definitely was. Uh, Stein, I don't know uh, because I don't know her story. But even if they were victims of Epstein, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can just come and testify in this uh, sentencing having to do with this trial. OK, because they're not directly cited in the prosecution's case. They were not used by the prosecution. Therefore, they're not considered direct victims of Gill and Maxwell in this prosecution. Okay. And there might have been reasons why the prosecution didn't use uh, Ransom or Virginia Roberts or any other number of victims because the prosecution most likely one of the best, most convincing stories and stories with the least amount of holes to make their case to the jury. So there might have been reasons why they didn't let Virginia Roberts come and testify and they didn't let Ransom testify because they didn't think that their stories were foolproof enough. Now, the the, the defense is always going to try to poke holes in the girls, uh, the victims um, arguments and their story. Of course, they tried to attack Jane in many different ways, say that she's just acting because she's an actress and they and, and they attack the other victims as well. So the prosecution tries to pick the best presentable um, victims with the best stories um, that the jury will take seriously. And they didn't pick these two people for whatever reason. Maybe they, did, they didn't even ask to be represented. I don't know. I don't know why they weren't picked, but they weren't picked. So they're not direct victims of this crime. And therefore, they don't have a legal right to come and uh, speak at the sentencing uh, hearing. That's for the, the victims, the direct victims of Gillen Maxwell's crimes and for the family members who are impacted by those crimes. OK, so that's how things stand um, right now. Uh, we'll see what happens. The judge will be making a decision on who she allows to speak at the sentencing. And um, unfortunately, the law in this case is on the side of Gillen Maxwell. That's just how things stand. OK. All right. Lastly, I just want to say that I'm still looking into that so-called assassination attempt that Gillen Maxwell's lawyers claimed a couple last week, um, a couple of days ago, um, most likely complete BS or an exaggeration. Um, but nevertheless, the Justice Department will probably respond to it in the next coming days. They haven't written their memorandum of law in response to Gillen Maxwell's last uh, last one regarding sentencing. So we'll see what the uh, I want to see what the prosecutors have to say first, because right now we just have this ridiculous claim made by Gillen Maxwell. The Justice Department spokesperson didn't respond when asked about it. So we don't know what their stance is. Hopefully they're looking into it. Um, I think it's mostly BS, the idea that somebody tried to pay off an inmate to uh, 
to kill Gil and Maxwell is ridiculous. Okay, that's what they were saying that the the inmate was paid to, or or the inmate was offered to be paid to strangle Gil and Maxwell. So she wasn't even paid. So nothing is verifiable. If if they said that the inmate was paid, then the Justice Department can go and and uh, you know hunt down using their forensic accountants, hunt down the person who actually paid this uh, inmate to actually do the strangling. <laughs> but they say that she was only approached. She wasn't actually paid. So nothing is verifiable at this point. Nothing is verifiable. All all they all we have is the hearsay uh, testimony of Gill and Maxwell's lawyers. And I don't believe them. Okay. So we'll have to see what happens there. I'll be making a video when we have anything solid uh, to report. But as things stand right now, it's just a crazy just another crazy claim by Gill and Maxwell's lawyers. All right. All right. So thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for future videos. And if you want to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the description box down below. Thank you so much for watching. As always, peace. I'm Enigma Smith, and you're watching the news on Mega City Today. The arts world is mourning the death of Quentin Quayle, who was found dead at his home in Britsit. It seems the director was murdered by an assassin who then masqueraded as Quayle, taking his place on his trip to the Big Meg. The assassin's true identity was uncovered by Judge Dredd, who executed the killer. Dredd is now recovering in hospital after receiving severe stab wounds. We'll have more on this story at midday. Chief Judge Hershey. Don't get up, Dredd. How's the stomach? Uh, Robo Dogs say I'll be back in the streets tomorrow, once the Rappy Heel Patches have done their job. Mm, that's good news. Now, Britsit has formally apologized. Yeah. Apparently, Erebus used to be one of their own judges, but he went into business for himself. Yeah, that explains a lot. The Brits wanted to avoid a diplomatic incident, so they sent Bertram to kill Erebus before he could kill you. <laughs> You say I have to work on my diplomatic skills. <laughs> well, I've got to get back to the halls of justice. You up to seeing another visitor? Depends who it is. Steele, get in here. Yes, ma'am. See you on the streets, Dredd. Hmm.